worship you, our creator and redeemer, believing that you are present with us. We confess that we have sinned against you in thought, word, and deed, by what we have done and by what we have left undone. Forgive us of our sins, heal and transform us by the Spirit, and raise us to new life in Jesus Christ, our Lord. Those of you here, if you want to stand with us, join us in our first song. the way, greet them, say hello, how they're doing, um, and thank you for singing so well.
All right, everybody took, a, took time to connect with each other, so now we're going to take time to connect with the family in this church. I want to invite them up, and we're going to do seven questions. You all are familiar with this part of our service. So up on the screen is my cell phone number. I have my cell phone here in my pocket. If you think of any questions or something, you're just like, oh, my goodness, I really want to ask these guys this question, please text me. All right, here's the microphone. Who should I hand it to first? All right. Tell me your guys' names. I'm Sunny Taku. I'm Emmanuel Bacon. And I'm Thomas Koo. All right. All right. Je vais demander la question prochaine. Oh, Where are you? one more. Masoda. Masoda. All right. Je vais demander la question prochaine en français. And après, nous pouvons faire la traduction pour les autres. So, d'où venez-vous? Okay, I asked where they're from. They said Cameroon. There's the translation. All right. So when did you move here from Cameroon? I and Emmanuel and I, we moved here two years ago. All right, two years, two years ago. ago. Thomas. Yeah, and yeah, Thomas. Uh, I think eight years ago. <laughs> eight years ago. Very good. So let me do the math. Does that mean you guys moved here two years ago? You guys moved here eight years ago, so that's six years apart. Wow. How did you stay in touch? Oh, okay. That's a good point. Thank you. That's good. Well, we were using Skype a lot. Uh -huh. and, uh, pretty much Skype only, actually. All right. All right. <laughs> okay, so now I want to ask, what do, you get, what do you do for a living? Okay, I, well, I work as a patient identity expert for a company based in Denver. Oh, very good. Very good. And I'm a software engineer with Oracle. Excellent, excellent. All right. So, Emmanuel, I asked these guys what they do. I want to ask you, what do you do for fun? What's your favorite game? Tempo Run Oz. Tell us what that is. A game where you have to run away from some monsters and you also have to get coins. Oh, sounds pretty intense. Is it intense? Uh, yeah. Yeah, all right, all right. Very good. All right. So tell me, after church on Sabbath, what do you guys like to do after church normally? Well, we're not actually big outdoor fans. So <laughs> usually what we do is we go, to, we go home and we uh, do Bible trivia, and later on we go to a park, and that's very how we good. spend our Sabbaths. Wonderful. That sounds very, very restful. Okay. All right. So you guys are familiar with the next few questions that are coming. I want to ask you, what is your vision for the Boulder Church? Well, um, it's more of a prayer. Um, I think as a church, we are already doing a lot of things right, in my opinion, like mm. involvement in the community. Mm. Amen. Um, but I've, uh, well, I've always thought that a perfect church uh, should always be led by the Spirit and make sure that we do not actually follow our own agendas. Mm -hmm. So my vision or prayer rather is uh, for us to be always led by the Spirit and be even more involved in the community. Mm -hmm. That's one part of it. Another part of it is evangelization. Uh, mm -hmm. I think that um, it's good to be relevant to our community. We have uh, several programs like Boho and mm -hmm. Feeding the Homeless. Mm -hmm. um, I think it's also our call to be uh, spreading the word and uh, uh, planting the seed and let mm -hmm. the Holy Spirit do the rest. Mm -hmm. So uh, I wish and pray that we would be more involved in that area as well in that evangelization and a more active presence on the Boulder campus in particular. Mm. See you, Boulder. Mm. All right. And then I want to ask, as we enter into prayer here, is there anything that we can pray for as a church for your family? Oh my gosh, the list is so long. But to make it short, uh, we have a really, my mom is supposed to, we wish that she's, she come next week. Oh. And she has an appointment for the visa on Monday. So we really ask you to join, to join us for into prayer in order for 
the visa embassy to grant uh, to grant her the visa. Oh yes. Uh, just to add, uh, it might be um, surprising to you that that would be our prayer request, but uh, the visa. The visa process in our country is very uh, difficult. You really never know what to expect. And mm. we really would want her to come and join us for the summer. So yes. please pray, for, pray with us. Yes, all right. If everybody would stand with me, we'll enter into prayer. Dear God, we are so blessed to be here in a safe, nurturing local community. Lord, our community is not only local, but it's global. We have friends and family around the world. Right now, I want to ask for your presence um, with the embassy as they um, work towards granting visas. We want to pray that you guide um, the Coos family's mother as she works to get her visa to come visit here, come visit her kids, her grandkids, and the family. Lord, bless that process as we know it can be challenging. God, be with us as a church. Lord, be with us, be with our pastors as they're together right now in a retreat, um, looking at what it means to be called. Lord, be with the Seventh-day Adventist religion and overall as we enter into the general conference. Lord, no matter what decisions are made at that GC, help us to know that all will work together for good and you are with us no matter what. God, today, help us enjoy one another's company. Help us enjoy the Sabbath rest and give us peace. Amen. comfortable standing for our next uh, few songs, please do so and join us um, as we sing them, Blessed Be Your Name.
darkness closes in, Lord, still I will say, blessed be the name of the Lord, blessed be your name, blessed be the name of the Lord, blessed be your glorious name, blessed be the times. I know it's one of my favorites. Um, it's called All the Poor and Powerless.
pick it up a little bit. This song's called Enough. We're gonna do it the next couple of weeks. It was kind of a new one to me, but I guess it's I guess it's been around for a little bit. But I really like it. <laughs> it goes, although you is more than enough for all of me for every thirst and every need you satisfy me with your love and all I have in you is more than ลูกชิ้นไม้หนึ่งนะลุงนี่ครับเ
ใช่ไหมครับขอบคุณค่ะเอาลูกชิ้นไม้หนึ่งนะลุงนี่ครับJust know it's okay to laugh and giggle and enjoy that a little bit. I know I did. I couldn't help myself, honestly, when I found that little sketch. It was, uh, it was something beautiful. So I thought I'd share it with all of you. Now you've seen it. Now you can experience it. Now you can all go out and adopt a street dog from Korea because <laughs> they're fantastic. This week uh, marks the beginning of a three-week series we'll be exploring together that I've entitled... Now that's something, which I believe warrants a little bit of explanation. See, back when I was in high school, there was a series of CDs that came out that were called "Now That's What I Call Music." Is anyone familiar with these? I got a yes from Cecile, which I hate to say I had to say that again because if you're excited about that, I'm about to make it a little bit worse by explaining it a little bit more. Unfortunately, I too fell for the "Now That's." What I call music series more than a few times, unfortunately, many, many times. Yeah, yeah, that pity groan is necessary in this case. The idea is that recording labels would basically pick from their own artists. They would take music from all these like wild genres that never went together. And they would put them onto one CD, and they would sell it to us basically as as a mixtape. And it was, like I said, mismatched lyrics, just awful, awful. And they were expensive. You were paying like way more than you would pay today just to get the same songs on iTunes. But this is where we got the idea for not only the series but for the posters. Has anyone seen the posters in the hallway or maybe the digital ones online? If you haven't, go take a look. They're also pretty awful. But we did that on purpose. Because in this case, uh, Pastor Elias said to me when he was trying to come up with the imagery for these, he said he was going for epilepsy-inducing satire, fireworks, and jazz hands, eliciting images of the battle hymn of the Republic, the birthing of bald eagles, and the 21 cannon salute. And in my opinion, he nailed it. Now, besides the jazz hands, the notion of the Now CD series was meant to give us an idea of how to mark. The current Billboard charts and endorse the top 20 songs that you should be aware of in pop culture today. The Now CD series was the flagship of rap, rock, pop, and punk. The cover art reminded you to stop, look, and listen because this is the trend in culture that you should be aware of. This notion of sending up the flare of awareness was what spurred the idea for this series. The three sermons are entitled "Now That's Something Worth Talking About." Now that's something worth living for, and concluding with "Now that's something worth dying for." 
Together, we will explore these conversations that are already in progress in our community, in our church, and in our personal lives over these next three sermons. But we begin this service as part of the series in Scripture. And I begin today in Luke 10, verses 25 through 37. It says, just then a lawyer stood up to test Jesus. Teacher, he said, what must I do to inherit eternal life? He said to him, what is written in the law? What do you read there? He answered, you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your strength and with all your mind. And you should love your neighbor as yourself. And he said to him, you have given the right answer. Do this and you will live. But wanting to justify himself, the lawyer asked Jesus, but who is my neighbor? Jesus replied, a man was going down from Jerusalem to Jericho and fell into the hands of robbers who stripped him, beat him, and went away, leaving him half dead. Now, by chance, a priest was walking down that road, and when he saw him, he passed on the other side. So likewise, a Levite, when he came to the place and saw him, passed by on the other side. But a Samaritan, while traveling, came near him, and when he saw him, he was moved with pity. He went to him and bandaged his wounds, having poured oil and wine on them. Then he put him on his own animal, brought him to an inn, and took care of him. The next day he took out two denarii, gave them to the innkeeper, and said, Take care of him, and when I come back, I will repay you whatever more you spend. Which of these three do you think was a neighbor to the man who fell into the hands of the robbers? The lawyer said, the one who showed him mercy. Jesus said to him, go and do likewise. Now, this is no mysterious section of scripture, and assuredly, this is a story you've heard countless times before which makes it, I believe, a perfect choice to be featured on a top 10 list for our textual mixtape. The story on the surface is basic. Jesus is sitting with a man discussing issues of race, religion, ethics, and morality. Jesus answers a few of the man's direct questions, but really begins to teach when he lays out a scenario very familiar to the man, as unfortunately this was a common scene in a world they both lived in. While walking down the street, a man was brutally attacked, choked, pinned down, shot, stabbed, spit upon, humiliated, stripped of his dignity, and relieved of his possessions before being left bleeding and unconscious in the middle of a road for four hours after he was dispatched. Many people passed by the scene after the fact, including a local pastor traveling to heal a small child in a nearby town. Seeing the man lying on the street, the pastor measured his options and opted to pass by without breaking his stride. Later, an elder passed by on her way to a council meeting, and after measuring her schedule to the distance she still needed to travel, also passed by the man without incident. Much later, a random passerby happened upon the scene from a tribe of people who were not unfamiliar to scenes like these. He was just leaving a church service where they had been studying for months on subjects of grace and social justice. The man recognized that God was present in this moment. Taking the lead of the gospel message, the church member picked up the broken man and carried him to safety. Giving away all that he had in his possession, he left the man at a local church and continued on his way in order to search for more opportunities to do God's will. The story ends with Jesus asking a difficult question. In this neighborhood, who responded according to the spirit of faith, hope, and love? This question, I believe, still lingers as it rings out in the mind's eye of our world today. As all of us are overtly aware, the headlines over the past few months have had an overarching theme of violence. The events of Ferguson, Missouri, McKinney, Texas, the stages of presidential candidates throwing their hats in the ring for the coming election, the pews of churches in Charleston, the flagpoles flying over the buildings in lower southern states, the walls of Facebook pages when referencing the covers of Vanity Fair magazines, and the news circuits as they cover the lives 
of people struggling with identity, of gender, race, and sexuality. The fire, it seems, is far from extinguished as we look further down the road we are already traveling on in order to get from here to there. The street that we are walking is littered with the bodies of those perpetrated against for this reason or that. Soon and very soon, the heat of these arguments will come to our own doorstep on a few different fronts. Just this week, the decisions of the Supreme Court on the legality of same-sex marriage will inevitably start a more pervasive understanding of an issue for us in our nightly news segments. Assuredly, the incidents under the purveyance of hate crimes will become more and more prevalent. When homosexual men and women enter into the light of day from under the shadows they felt as though they must live within, they may not find safety in this world. So too will our own church be on display as the delegations from the General Conference of the Seventh-day Adventist Church convene in San Antonio to decide on the direction of our world church as it pertains to the ordination of women as equal to men. Lines will be drawn in the sand no matter what side you stand on. There will be suffering on either side because of these actions. And unfortunately, people will be harmed. Which is why this section of scripture stands out so clearly and so strongly in my mind today. The question that Jesus poses, which of these do you think was a neighbor to the man who fell into the hands of the attackers, is still worthy of being answered each and every time we look into our news feeds, we post to our Facebook pages, and are a part of our personal conversations. The reality of the question remains the same, but the neighborhood has changed. Our neighborhood is not the same as it was that day. Before, the question was posed around the situation involving faceless robbers. Today, we have to wrestle with more than just common thieves but instead with law enforcement and their tactics being used in hostile situations. Sworn men and women of the law who have taken the force seemingly too far. Issues beyond those versus city of city or church versus church, but instead now conversations of black versus white, ethnicity versus culture, Republican versus Democrat, human versus human. The story is no longer as simple as, can't you see where the line has been drawn between the battle against good and evil? Aren't you able to tell who the bad guys are when they're being bad and the good guys are being good, like in this story I've laid out? No longer is it just what the eye can see. The neighborhood has changed. It is because of this shift that we must be willing to take a closer look at ourselves in light of these situations on roads to Jericho and of the streets of Ferguson. Now, I've taken from a distant view. The actions of the Bible seem to take on a clearer picture. On the surface, we assign a level of thought to each of the characters as they encounter the scene that Jesus lays out. And honestly, we're quick to judge the priest and the Levite for carelessly traipsing past the poor, battered man. But we must not forget that the priest did not end his story there. No, not at all. The priest went on to forgive sins, baptize believers in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. He said grace. He gave Bible studies, conducted weddings, ministered over funerals, preached the gospel, gave to the poor, tended to the weak, gave hope to the lost, and loved as Jesus loved him. We must not forget that the Levite went on to care for the sanctuary and those who came into its open doors. The Levite looked after the priest and ministered to the people on how to keep covenant laws, exemplified the guidelines on how to maintain the tents, watched over the sacred altars, offered themselves as gifts to God's ministry, and assisted those who wished to bring an offering to God's temple. These were not bad people. These were good people. These were God's people, people in need of forgiveness for their transgressions. When taken with a surface understanding of God's movement in the world, the, tru the story is truly nothing out of the ordinary. But church, we are not people with surface understandings of God's actions and will for this world. 
We are a people strong in faith, rich in scriptural comprehension, draped in intelligence, aware of our salvation by grace, and blessed with the message of salvation by a loving God. In this knowledge of faith, hope, and love, we must also recognize our own need for forgiveness. Often we forget in the heat of an argument our purpose. We set aside our faith when in the presence of so much affluence and satisfaction. We cross the road of conviction before moments of discomfort. We navigate our conversations away from religion and away from politics amongst mixed company for fear of animosity. We often cite scripture as means of judgment and cruelty in order to maintain dividing lines. We use our status to degrade those less fortunate in order to create some distance between one another for fear of cross-contamination. Church, we have all been the priest. We have all been the Levite. And we strive to be like the Good Samaritan. But church, we cannot forget that something cannot be unseen from the height that we are able to see it in our context today. The truth of the matter is the richness of this story comes only from the inclusion of priests, Levites, and Samaritans. The story is complete in the entire cast of characters. We have failed to see that God has used each and every one of them for good in the end, even the men of ill intent. For it was their actions that led the world to believe in good, even in the face of so much evil. Now, today is the Sabbath day, but church, tomorrow is coming. And with it, all sorts of chaos and emotions and decisions that will need to be made in a moment's notice. Today, it is my hope that you have been charged to think like the Samaritan did. But tomorrow is still coming. And with it comes opportunities to cross to the other side of the road. Unfortunately for us, the actions of the priest, the Levite, the Samaritan, and the men of ill intent are all within the realm of possibilities of choices in our own daily lives. And unfortunately, there are men in this world who are being charged to believe that they should be emboldened to become more like the darker shadows of the story, even those that we do not suspect. While watching the Netflix original show, Daredevil, I came across a scene in the final episode of the first season that deals with this very issue. Now, without giving out too much to anyone who has not yet seen it for themselves, I see you in the back shaking your head no. I am with you. I will not give too much away. I will keep my synopsis as brief as possible. One of the characters is being restrained by a police force and is en route to a holding cell that will soon be his new permanent home. The man is considered a villainous character by some and a savior and a philanthropist to others. Making the scene in itself an incredible juxtaposition, it adds a layer onto a parallel within this sermon. The man begins a monologue to the guards flanking his side in the back of an armored truck that is carrying him on a bridge between two cities. It begins with, I was thinking about a story from the Bible. I'm not a religious man, but I've read bits and pieces of it over for I've read bits and pieces over the years. Curiosity more than faith. But this one story. There was a man. He was traveling from Jerusalem to Jericho when he was set upon by men of ill intent. They stripped the traveler of his clothes and beat him, and they left him bleeding in the dirt. And a priest happened by, saw the traveler, but he moved to the other side of the road and continued on. And then a Levite, a religious functionary, he came to the place, saw the dying traveler, but he too moved to the other side of the road, passed him by. But then came a man from Samaria, a Samaritan, a good man. He saw the traveler bleeding in the road, and he stopped to aid him without thinking of the circumstance or the difficulty it might bring him. The Samaritan tended to the traveler's wounds, applying oil and wine, and he carried him to an inn, gave him all the money he had for the owner to take care of the traveler. As a Samaritan, he continued on his journey. 
He did this simply because the traveler was his neighbor. He loved his city and all the people in it. I always thought I was the Samaritan in that story. It's funny, isn't it? How even the best of men can be deceived by their true nature. Confused of this meaning, the guard prods him further. What does that mean? It means that I am not the Samaritan, that I am not the priest or the Levite, that I am the ill intent who set upon the traveler on a road he should not have been on. It is at that point that the convoy is attacked by a small army of militants hired to relieve the philanthropist of his bondage. Unfortunately, the actions of the priest, the Levite, the Samaritan, and the men of ill intent are all within the possibility of choices in our daily life decisions. The question becomes, what are we going to do with our faith, our knowledge, our intelligence, our beliefs, our better judgment, our convictions, our scripture, our time, and our vision when presented with a scenario like this one in our own lives. See, if told another way, the story could play out like this for us today. Dylan Roof, the shooter of the nine members of the Charleston Church prayer group, was going down from Mapleton to Broadway. He fell into the hands of robbers who stripped him, beat him, and went away, leaving him half dead. Zokar Sarnayev, the perpetrator of the Boston Marathon bombings, was crossing at the Pearl Street Mall. He fell into the hands of robbers who stripped him, beat him, and went away, leaving him half dead. Caitlyn Jenner, leaving from a local spa, was fallen into the hands of robbers who stripped her, beat her, and went away, leaving her half dead. Place anyone in this list and see if the story remains the same. Officer Daniel Pantaleo, the officer who placed Eric Garner in a fatal chokehold. Abdullah Ahmed Abdullah, sitting atop the FBI's most wanted terrorist list. Officer Darren Wilson, the officer charged with fatally shooting Michael Brown. James Holmes, the Aurora Theater shooter. Rachel Dolezal, the once president of the Spokane chapter of the NAACP. Adam Lanza, the gunman from the Sandy Hook elementary shootings. George Zimmerman, the neighborhood watch patrolman who, caved, who, who killed Trayvon Martin, a member of the Westboro Baptist Church, Donald Trump, Corporal Eric Casebolt, the McKinney officer who arrested children at a pool party, a prominent member of the KKK, a man proudly displaying a Confederate flag on his T-shirt, an outspoken proponent of hate crimes against homosexuals, If left to our own devices, our emotional tendencies and our wavering ability to focus in the heat of the moment when it is upon us, we may cross the street and shield our eyes when these events happen before us. The belief that this is not of God, this does not concern us, may cause us not to be able to see that God is about to do something brilliant. And we may be afraid to witness. Therefore, we need to spend some time talking about these things. Yes, racism is messy. Yes, violence is scary. Yes, the Constitution is controversial. Yes, issues of gender equality are volatile. Yes, issues of homosexuality are divisive. Yes, issues of gender and race reassignment are turbulent. And yes... Forgiveness is emotional. But we cannot afford to look away and close ourselves off from witnessing the changes in our neighborhood any longer. When we avoid the conversation, the tension builds anyways. And if not countered, we will find ourselves breaking down. Having no outlet, we will become a ticking time bomb, which is easily set off in moments of weakness. When the situation is no longer just on the news, when the victim is no longer a stranger and we become subject to our emotional outbursts alone, we allow ourselves to be ensnared with the side of ill intent. So church, 
Let us engage this world with the same passion we bring to our own personal faith. In order to truly protect this house, we ought not build a fence around the perimeter. But instead, let us fling open our doors wide in order to be ready to experience whatever God has planned to bring our way. Because someday, one of our people is going to fling open our doors for us when we are not expecting it. And into our sanctuary, they will drag a lifeless body in need of immediate assistance. This will be someone that our pastoral team knows from our community because we had seen them on the way to a Bible study and couldn't stop. It will be someone that our elders know because they had spotted them while running late for a meeting. Some people will recognize them due to their appearance on the daily camera from their constant run-ins with the law. They will be known for their ill repute and their transgressions and may be considered untouchable. Church, let us not be caught as surprised or unprepared when it is our turn to respond. Let us be ready by opening up ourselves to the discomfort, to the turbulent, the emotional, the divisive, the volatile, the controversial, the scary, and the messy. If for only that when the day comes and it is our time to act, we will not have to stop short of action in order to start the conversation we were too afraid to have. God has a plan for all of us. Some days we find ourselves as part of the scenery of something greater as we pass it on by, unaware of what God is doing to work through of us. Sometimes that means we are the priest and the Levite. Sometimes it means that we will be overtaken by people of ill intent. Sometimes it means that we are being called to do something far greater than expected. Sometimes it means that we are the reason for someone else's pain and suffering. So if you ever are to find yourself in a place where you are surrounded by people of ill intent, fear not. For God is working something greater than you could ever imagine. And if you ever find yourself in a place where you are the ill intent, just know that you are not the end of the story. God is there working for good even when you are not. If ever you find yourself just passing through and wondering whatever happened to the man, fallen behind and forgotten, know that God is taking care of him far beyond anything that you had expected or were capable of doing yourself at the time. If ever you find yourself unable to pass by the moment because of a tug on your heart to act rather than look away, well, then hold on tight. Because God is about to use you in a way that you have been preparing for your entire life. To be that kind of church, to be that kind of people, it may mean that we need to stand tall against the waves of adversity. It will mean holding the tough conversations here in our church and being willing to ask and answer the tough questions. Those questions like, where will you be when the crisis hits? What will your church do when it comes to our doors? And how will you respond when it's your turn to walk upon the scene? If nothing else, I would hope that we all agree that it's something worth talking about. Thank you, Pastor Jay. Uh, this is Community Life, and first I'd like to make a big shout out to Earl Lambeth, uh, who has restored our fountain. So if you have the opportunity, please go out. The flowers are beautiful. The fountain is running. Thank you, Earl, very much. Um, also, um, many of you who were here last week um, saw Tony Hunter. Uh, the conference and the church have extended an invitation to Tony, and he has graciously accepted. So Tony Hunter and his wife will be joining our church uh, beginning in August. If you'd like to reach out to him before that, his contact information, while humorous, is in the bulletin, so you should check it out. And finally, if you have young children, um, our church is having a VBS, a vacation, excuse me, a VBC, a vacation Bible camp, 
It'll be July 13th through 17th, and this is a great opportunity for kids to come face to face with Jesus. So please check it out and see if you can get your children registered. Uh, our church uh, is sponsoring it. With the deacons, please stand. Gracious Father, we thank you for your blessings, and we thank you for the opportunity to return our tithes and offerings. In Jesus' name, amen. May Jesus bless you with strength against all principalities. Oh, may Jesus bless you with gentleness and a heart that is tender. May Jesus bless you with strength against all principalities. May Jesus bless you with compassion and care. 
May Jesus bless you with courage, daring you to be who you are. May Jesus bless you with openness, understanding, and respect. May Jesus bless you with the power to make Jesus all. Always.